Okay, so let's begin. My name is Mayalen Laving Martel. I'm the campaign coordinator here at Development in Peace Caritas Canada, and I'm very happy to be here with you to launch the advocacy part of our campaign, Reaping Our Rights, that was launched originally this past Lent. This campaign focuses on peasant rights all over the world. So we will begin. So I would like to start by a territorial acknowledgement. I invite every one of you to write also in the chat where you're coming from today. So I would like to begin by acknowledging that the National Office of Development in Peace Caritas Canada is located on unceded indigenous land. The, the Kanyan Kehaga Nation is recognized as the custodians of the land and waters on which I am today. Jogjoge, Montreal, is historically known as a gathering place for many First Nations. Today, it is home to a diverse population of indigenous and other peoples. So, on the agenda today, we will start by a few welcoming words from Luke's talking. And then we'll go, we will go straight to the heart of the subject with our special guests, Celeste Smith from the National Farmers Union, Nimo Bassi from Nigeria, our, our partner Hometh, Aidan Girlchrist Blackwood from the CNCA. We will have a short question and answer period with all of our guests, and then we will go over the resources to carry out the campaign in your communities, and we will end by a closing prayer. So, without further ado, Luke, I will let you say a few words. Thank you, Mayelen, and thank you, everybody, for being here with us this on the Zoom for the launching of our fall campaign. Something that started with the uh, Lent this year. I'd like to highlight the presence today of many persons very important persons for us from development and peace for our movement. We have a few bishops among us today. We have the bishop of our national council and a member of our executive, Mr. Jan Hansen, who's with us and also welcome to all the members of our national council who are with us today. Members, present members, and also some ex members of the council, national council. So we've been ex-presidents, so welcome to all of you and welcome to all the members who are here, who are part of our diocesan councils across Canada. You're the ones that really undertake the campaigns in the parishes in, the, in, the, in everywhere. So thank you very much to each one of you. So today we are here uh, to launch the uh, fall campaign, the fall action of our Reaping Our Rights campaign, uh, which is the second campaign of our theme of Create Hope, as you see. And these campaigns are so important for us to be able to create hope in the world, as the gospel calls us to do. And with our fall campaign this year, we are going further from uh, Lent, where we first learned and we're learning about the struggles of peasant farmers throughout the world, uh, people who are close to God's creation, you know, people who are close to the land. Uh, and, it, and it's because of them that so much of our world is fed. Uh, without them, so many of us would not be able to eat. And we need to recognize that and remember their importance. Uh, the word peasant is something in the English language that is often looked down on, but yet these are the people who are closest to God's creation. And as they do that work to bring forth the fruit of the earth and to, to feed the world, uh, they face incredible, incredible challenges and obstacles. And they are some of the most oppressed and marginalized people in the human family. And, and so that is why this fall, uh, to, we are dedicating this campaign to helping them to reap their rights. Today, we are going to hear about UNDROP, an important effort that comes came from movements of peasants themselves to bring forward and assert their rights and what we can do in Canada to help them reap those rights looking for a good strong law to do that so that Canadian companies will do their due diligence and we're going to hear a lot about 
uh, that from our special guests here today. We have, of course, our special guests who will speak about Undrop, something that most of us have probably never heard of before. And also from a longtime partner, the CNCA, about how we want to find a way to put this Undrop into action here in Canada by having a strong due diligence law. And, you know, due diligence, I mean, it's the bare minimum, really, that we want our corporations to do. Ideally, we want them to go beyond due diligence to be able to ensure that those who are, again, close to the land and who are struggling, uh, not only are not oppressed, but are able to flourish. And we need strong laws to do that. And that's why we're gathered today to, to la launch this campaign. So thank you for being here. And we hope that this will be an inspiring day for you to go forward, to go forth into your communities and to collect as many signatures as possible. Because really, this is the thing that we have, each and every one of us, that is so powerful within us is the power of our own name and to put our names. And we're asking you today to put your names uh, to our call for a strong law for Canadian companies that would ensure that the rights that peasants have asserted for themselves are enshrined in law. And not only to sign yourselves, but to bring your names and your voice and to invite others to do that as well, too. So we hope that uh, by April, when we deliver the fruit of this campaign to Parliament Hill, that we will be a voice of many tens of thousands of people. So... And as we go forth today, then, and, I'll, uh, and I wish you all well, I want to call upon God's blessing upon all of us, uh, that we ask that God would, would bless our campaign, and uh, who better to offer that blessing for us than um, Bishop Jan Hansen, the member of our executive councils, uh, uh, of our national council. So uh, thank you, everybody, again, for being here, and grand merci à tout le monde d'être ici, et... Uh, we thank everybody who's here, who are here. I hope that this afternoon will be an inspiration for us. In other words, to carry the campaign to the made to the Canadian public, to our families, parishes, and the church. And so, thank you very much. And what, Monsignor, Monsignor Hansen, your your mic is yours. Merci. Thank you, Luke. So let us pray together in the name of the Father. Son and Holy Spirit. Gracious God, as we gather on this autumn day, we give you thanks for the technology that brings us together from coast to coast to coast. Uh, we pray for the, for the many farmers across the global south who are struggling for justice and peace in their own lands, that their work on the land may be rewarded with the, the grace of God and the the benefit of being able to provide for their families and so many people in their countries. We pray for our own farmers as they enter into a time of harvest, that it may be a, a successful harvest and, and one of uh, something to be proud of as they uh, provide also for, for us here at home. Bless our meeting, bless our presenters, and help us to uh, rise to the challenge of this year's this year's campaign as we uh, uh, look at the rights of all those who are in need of God's help. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Bishop Yarm. So now we will present to you the short animated clip that we created to explain what this campaign is all about. So I will let you watch it and we will come back right after. Around the globe, peasant and rural communities care for the earth and feed the world. Yet, they face many challenges. Climate change, land grabbing, resource theft, industrial pollution, and more. Undaunted, they organize and advocate for their rights. Their courageous mobilization led to the adoption of UNDROP, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Peasants and Other People Working in Rural Areas. UNDROP aims to protect peasants' rights to land, water, seeds, food sovereignty, a clean environment, and much more. But peasants in the Global South feel powerless when foreign corporations violate their human and environmental rights. So that no Canadian company can do that, we call Canada to adopt mandatory human rights and environmental due diligence legislation. 
Such a law would require our companies to prevent, report, and remedy human and environmental rights violations across their global operations and supply chains, and enable the people they harm to seek justice in Canadian courts. Together, let's work towards reaping our rights so that all may live in dignity. Signed in solidarity with peasant farmers in the Global South, devp.org slash act. So let's start with meeting our special guests. We will start with Celeste Smith. She's the founder and director of Cultural Seeds and Gagiti Gemi Gamik. She's really interested in traditional indigenous agriculture and seeds. She is also the co-chair of the International Programs Committee of the National Farmers Union. She is also a delegate of La Via Campesina. So, let me present to you Celeste Smith. Here you go, Celeste. Sigoli, everyone. In my language, of Oneida. That means, <laughs> sorry, interpreters. <laughs> It's the language of Oneida, and that means uh, hello. I'm going to speak a little bit of Oneida, just just a little bit. So. Don't panic, <laughs> interpreters. Uh, I will also ask you, um, when I meet you, I will ask you, Skanagoha, Skanagoha kin. And Skanagoha kin means, um, how is the great peace or how is the peace within you? So I ask you that all that today. How is the peace within you today as we meet? Um, so Ni Yang Yat Celeste Smith. My name is Celeste Smith. And I'd just like to start by thanking um, thanking everyone here for being here and um, really joining our fight here in Canada to adopt the UNDROP and to fight for peasants' rights. I'm going to go in a little bit about um, the UNDROP and the Canadian Connection and how we are um, really one of the founders of um, the food sovereignty movement um, within the world. So I'm going to share my screen um, right now. Okay, no more, no more um, Indigenous languages interpreters. I will be speaking English from now on. <laughs> But I think it's important that folks get to hear um, some of the first languages of, uh, of this land. And as an Indigenous farmer myself, um, it's one of my reclamation activities, always to speak a little bit of, of uh, of my language every day. So what I'll be speaking on today is the National Farmers Union and the UNDROP. So I am a member of the National Farmers Union. Um, I'm also, I'm Ongwe Hongwe, which in uh, Mohawk actually means uh, first people or original people. Um, I'm Oneida from Six Nations, which is around the Brantford area, um, just outside of Toronto. Um, I'm all these things, but Uh, I'm actually a seed keeper, a uh, generational seed keeper. Um, so I keep um, indigenous seeds that our family has kept for thousands of years. So these, this is what really what brought me into the National Farmers Union in Canada and onto the international stage, as you can see, um, because our rights as farmers, our rights as indigenous people are often intertwined because in many countries, including Um, there is legislation also coming in Canada. It is, it is illegal to save seeds. And this might be shocking to some people who have always done this, but um, this is something that we really need to be concerned with. And we are actually within the National Farmers Union. I'm also part of, as you can see here, La Via Campesina, which is what I'm going to uh, describe them a little bit. And um, it's, a, it's a wonderful group um, where we go all over the world and fight for uh, food sovereignty. We learned a little bit of what food sovereignty was um, in the video, but I'm going to go in, into deeper into why. Why is this so important and why does it affect all of us, even non-farmers, right? Just people living in the world. So this is my, uh, this is my home project. It's Gagids Gimme Gamik, or We Will Plant Lodge. Um, I'm coming to you today from Manitoulin Island in Northern Ontario. And this is where my Indigenous agri Agroecology School is. So that's a little bit about me. Now, so the National Farmers Union, I'll tell you a little bit about that. I hope everyone has heard of the National Farmers Union. Um, but if you're not a farmer, you might not have, have heard of us, but we're, um, 
50 years old. We're one of the oldest unions in Canada. And uh, we've really done a lot um, as far as making life better um, for a lot of people. Um, so this is a little picture here about, um, and that's myself, obviously, and that's Nettie Weeb. And Nettie Weeb is quite a famous um, person from our, uh, from our history and past and now, although she's getting close to retirement, uh, from the National Farmers Union. So she was the first, um, I am currently now um, the co-chair of the International Programs Committee. And she was one of, she was the original chair um, years ago. And so the National Farmers Union of Canada is a very strong union, it's small, but it's very important in protecting the rights of farmers and the rights of um, food and access, prices of food, all of these things, which really affect people every day because food um, in our thinking is a right for all people. So there's the two of us at one of our international um, meetings and uh, she's just wonderful. Now, the reason I've brought her up um, is because she's part of the reason why the National Farmers Union is the way it is and why food sovereignty actually as a movement is, is actually, um, she's one of the reasons why it's a thing, really. So the NFU, so the National Farmers Union of Canada advocates for a food system based on the principles of food sovereignty. So food sovereignty is um, a very important thing that you should know about because it calls for a food system that values farmers and what they grow. It rebuilds relationships between food producers and those who eat. It reclaims local decision-making about food production and environmental protection. And it strengthens connections between people the land, empowering communities and citizens to make intentional decisions based on local needs and conditions to ensure a resilient and sustainable future. So all of these things are based on community. They're based on things where we get to choose what we get to eat. Um, they're things based on we get to, um, we, we have rights, right? So the people have the rights. Um, and this is something that used to be inherent, right? We used to be able to choose what we could eat every day. But now, because transnational corporations, large grocery chains, I mean, they are choosing now what we get to eat, right? That's why local food is so expensive. Imported food coming in at the grocery store, store is cheap. So we end up having this dichotomy of, of the way it used to be, right, um, is, is no longer how it is. So we're trying to put um, really the right to food back into the hands of people and the right to food back into the hands of farmers. So that's kind of the basis of what the National Farmers Union does. We work on a lot of policy. We try to fight big seed companies. We, we, we try to fight for rights to water and these types of things. So, so what is food sovereignty? So not everyone understands what food sovereignty is. And that's, um, that's because um, it's not something that people talk about because we're so disconnected from our food now, right? We just go to the grocery store, we pick up our food, and then we come home and we consume it. But we do kind of think, okay, well, there's a lot of food coming from all over the world that we might not understand where it's coming from. Local food's very expensive. I don't know my farmer anymore. I'm not even sure what's in the food maybe that I'm buying, right? So food sovereignty is something where we're trying to reclaim that. So it empowers people, so farmers and eaters, to make important decisions about food and agriculture. So it takes it out of the hands of corporations and puts that back in our hands. So there are six pillars to food sovereignty. So you have to have these in order to have food sovereignty. So you have to focus on food for people. You have to, so food for people instead of um, food for um, biotech and these sort of, sorts of things. So the, the point of food is that it's for people. Um, it values the food providers. So that's um, the farmers, the workers in the fields, the growers. 
it localizes food systems. So we're talking about eating local food, having um, good food that's in the area that you're living, right? Not transporting in apples from New Zealand, right? We're eating our local apples um, and that's what we're, we're trying to, to do. It puts the control, um, sorry, and it um, puts the control locally so we can have that choice. I would rather have an apple from down the street at one of the orchards than an apple from New Zealand. I mean, New Zealand's great, but it's pretty obvious that transporting an, um, an apple all around the world is not good either economically or in a climate change or um, environmental way, right? So it also builds knowledge and skills. So we should be learning about our food. We should know what's in our food. We should know the difference between a GMO and a non-GMO food, um, these types of things. And it works with nature. So always nature is the main part of it, right? Is it good for the earth? Is our farming good for the earth or is it not, right? So these are really important things. So um, the National Farmers Union of Canada is one of the five founding members of the food sovereignty movement called La Vida Campesina. It's a huge um, movement. There are over 250 million peasant farmers, indigenous people and workers um, all over the world. And this is everything from you know, small farmers to um, people, um, to migrant workers that are working you know, in different fields all over to indigenous folks um, all over. So we've, we're really a, a diverse group and we're in almost every country, a hundred and I think it's 85 million countries now. And um, just, or sorry, 85 um, countries and 180 um, organizations. So it's really huge. I mean, we're talking everywhere, right? So, and it's a really good thing. <laughs> because um, as we have seen in the video and in a little video that I'm going to show up um, and you've probably seen even in your own life, food is um, changing and the way food is distributed, who controls food, all of those things are now out of our hands. This is why we get apples from New Zealand cheaper than apples from down the street, right? Which is um, absolutely, to me, bananas. <laughs> well, that was a bad one, eh? <laughs> Sorry, interpreters. Okay, so so the UNDROP um, is a UN declaration. You've heard of the UNDRIP, probably, which is about indigenous rights, right? So the UNDRIP is um, basically a... Um, um, a bunch of rights that are our, that are enshrined um, in uh, the United Nations, the which give rights to Indigenous people. Now the UNDROP is very similar. In fact, it was modeled after the UNDRIP, um, and it was mo and it was um, built over about seventeen to twenty years of work on the ground with peasants um, from La Via Campesina. So in this group, we all got together and we were like, okay, so we, we, we've we um, founded the, the food solidarity, or sorry, the food sovereignty movement. Now, where do we go from here? We need to teach other people what is happening in food systems, why things are changing, why we don't have any choice or rights around food anymore. And so we developed the UNDROP. So... Um, we've been um, negotiating and trying to get this in front of the United Nations for quite a while. And it did go in front of the United Nations finally, and um, it passed. It is now a United Nations declaration, um, but Canada did not adopt it. Canada abstained. Now, it also did the same thing with the UNDRIP originally. So... But so we're, that's another reason why we're really happy that people are learning about this in Canada, because Canada needs to adopt it. Um, now, the declaration is among um, essential international instruments that defend the rights of small scale farmers and producers. And it's a crucial tool in the implementation of food sovereignty. So without these, these rights, these collective rights, 
um, people will have um, folks um, will still get um, basically not sorry I have a I have a very elderly dog and um, he's blind and he's in my I'm so sorry but he's in my he needs to go out <laughs> I just need to open the door Anyway, so this, the reason why this declaration is important is because it's the first time ever, it's historic, that these rights have been written down, right? We've always just assumed, oh, farmers, well, they own their land, they have rights to grow food. Well, this is not true everywhere, right? So um, corporations are buying up land um, that's happening all over, not just um, in the global south, but... Um, a lot of us may know that Bill Gates is the largest landowner in um, the United States. So corporations are buying up land, buying up farmland. And um, so the rights of farmers are being um, impinged, um, not just in the global South, but in North America as well. It is very, very, one of the things we find in the National Farmers Union, Union is that young farmers cannot afford to buy land, right? It's very, land is very expensive as we all know. So who, and um, so who will be helping the next generation of farmers um, be on the land? Who is going to grow our food? These are huge questions, right? As Canada grows and needs more lands for housing, um, this is happening in Ontario. I'm sure it's happening all over the place, right? So land is shrinking and, but where are we gonna grow our food? So. That's why we're talking about some of these rights, right? So why is it why is it historic? Well, it's the first time that peasants and small, which means simply small scale farmers and workers um, as rights holders. And this is for the very first time, right? So it basically tells us that we have the right to control resources and our means of production. For example, I have the right to save my seeds. The seeds that my grandmother and my great grandmother have passed on to me over time, right? I also have the right to clean water. I have the right to be growing my crops in an area that is free uh, from pesticides if I want it to be. Um, and in my thinking, in my indigenous ways of growing, it should be, right? I also have the right to a dignified life. Um, I have the right to health and other services. For example, I have the right to food. And this is something that uh, maybe we don't think um, is important or as important in Canada as, is it, as it is in the global south, but in the Canadian context, there are a lot of people that have to grow certain types of GMO corn and they can't afford to grow the things that they really want or the feeds, things that really feed the community. They have to grow this type of corn because it's a cash crop, they have to sell it. So unfortunately, these are the things. So we have the right, right to food. And we also have the right to civil and political rights. So gender, youth, um, these things like we, we, have, we have rights, right? For example, the rights of peasants, peasant women. So peasant women are often on the front lines of things of like, like, like climate change, right? So it's really important that the rights of peasant women are upheld. Um, and because we are specifically tied to the land, right? So peasant women like myself are tied to the land because um, we, we use it not just for our survival, but our cultural survival, right? Not just for our nutrition, but also because um, being of the land and in the land is part of how I live as an indigenous person. And I have the right to that, right? I have the right to be on my homeland and 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 be there right and unfortunately my homeland what's in my homeland toronto <laughs> right so saying that i have the right to land is something that people would think well you have the right to yes i do have the right to land but how can i afford farmland around toronto right we're talking millions of dollars right indigenous people do not have this type of this type of money so again i am now forced up north um, to grow my crops that have always been in Haudenosaunee territory around the Great Lakes because I don't, because my right to land is not being respected. So this is how it kind of plays out. And as you can tell, 
these things are not just, these rights are not just for farmers and peasant farmers. These rights are for everyone, which is why the UNDROP is so important. It's really the first time that collective rights, so the right to water, the right to clean air, the right to clean land, the right to, um, you know, to food. These things have never been expressed in, in documents before um, with this type of power. So I know UN documents are super boring and I'm sorry, <laughs> but they are important because we can use them as a tool, right? And that's what we're doing on the ground, right? So the UNDROP in Canada. Okay, so as one of the founding members of LDC or La Vea Campesina, Canada's leadership on the UNDROP has helped lead the way, even if our state hasn't adopted it, right? So even if Canada hasn't adopted it, and these are some of the architects here from Canada um, who were there to, um, you know, to present the UNDROP um, to the United Nations. Jesse McGinnis, McGinnis actually is a good friend of mine, and she is one of the authors um, and as a youth she is um, very um, she's been very influential um, in doing this so so what is it okay so what can Canada do and what can we do as people to then further um, the UNDROP okay well we can use it in court and it has been used in court so even if we haven't adopted it we can still use it um, and then once it's used, the more something is used in law, the more precedent builds up and the more we can um, use it, right? To fight for rights. So here, so Canada did not uh, adopt the UNDROP in 2018, but in 2020, the Ontario Provincial Supreme Court cited the UNDROP in a major migrant workers rights, rights case. That decision has now set up a legal precedent in Canada, proving that the UNDROP can protect farmers and farm workers' human rights. So this is what we need to be doing. So lawyers need to learn about this um, and also um, civil rights organizations like yours and, and um, civil society needs to learn about this so we can push lawmakers to use these instruments even if we haven't adopted them here. So like I said, UNDROP is a tool in our struggle. It's not the end of our struggle, really. It's just the beginning because now we've developed this over 17 years and now we really need to make people understand why it's so important. But we can use it, right, in legal cases and education and training. So that's why I'm so happy that you're here. But tools, we must remember that tools are only valuable if you use them. So we need to use them, right? The important thing is that the UNDROP strengthens all humans right? Really important to know. Um, and it protects what matters to most, to all of us, land, water, um, food, and the rights of, of all people. Um, how am I doing for time? I have one more little clip, but if I'm over time, that's okay. Are we over time? A bit over time. Is the clip long? Yeah. It's fine. No, we can just we can just go into what you have. So okay. thank you so much. Um, I just wanted to show you that there's there's some resources available. Um, if you'd like to learn more, this is a huge, huge, huge document, right? I've only scratched the surface. Uh, 10 to 15 minutes is not a lot of time <laughs> to talk about a huge UN document, right? So um, so go to these defendingpeasantsrights.com is the best. It's actually the UNDROP website that we developed. Um, that is, um, we've got some amazing booklets on there, information booklets. Um, Jesse helped develop the the um, the writing um, in these comic books. Little graphic comics are easy to read, and it helps you understand. Uh, of course, La Via Campesina, Via Campesina, um, and that's Campesina, not Campesin. <laughs> dot org. Sorry, I made a uh, a mistake there. Um, and the National Farmers Union. Please uh, keep in touch with us. And let us know. Um, let us know what you think. We're always doing great, oops, great campaigns. And I just wanted to thank everyone for uh, for your interest and for your support. So, Nyango. Merci, merci beaucoup, Celeste. So, without further ado, let's go to our next guest, Nimo Bassi. He is our partner from Nigeria, presently in Thunder Bay as a solidarity visitor. 
He is the executive director of OMEF, Home of Mother Earth Foundation. He's also an architect and writer, a defender of human rights and of the environment. He advocates and raises awareness on the damage caused by all companies in the env to the environment and local populations. Thank you very much. And uh, thanks to Celeste for that presentation on Undrop. Uh, thanks to Lucas. Thanks to everyone in development and peace. Uh, I've already said I'm speaking from Thunder Bay, although there's no thunder these days. Everywhere is quiet, but <laughs> the weather is really beautiful. Uh, I've had the privilege of meeting with very engaging students uh, as well as members of Development and Peace, and I'm really glad to be here and to be part of this campaign that's been launched today. Uh, it's, it's, it's been a wonderful experience uh, coming to partnership, Development and Peace, and uh, our, the project we're doing together is titled Healing Our Land, Challenging Extractivism and Land Grabbing. Each segment of this title says a whole lot. Uh, healing the land, healing our land. Our land has been so so much damaged by forces of extractivism. Our land has been contaminated. Our land has been grabbed. Our land, everything unacceptable has been done to our land. I want to say our land, I'm speaking about, particularly about the land in Nigeria, the Niger Delta, but the same story is all over the world wherever extractivism reigns. Uh, and so, we are challenging extractivism because extractivism is deeply colonial and we have to decolonize the world and decolonize our territories from, from being grabbed by transnational corporations and forces working with them. Uh, so we, our land is polluted and our land needs to be healed. And healing the land requires the kind of tools that we've heard about uh, the UNDROP and other tools available. Uh, now, if you can look at that photo on the screen, uh, that, that's me standing uh, with, uh, you know, just looking at one of the first oil wells that were drilled in the Niger Delta. That oil well was drilled in the 1950s, abandoned in the 1970s. Uh, but by the time this, I made this visit, which was just a couple of months ago, the well, as you can see, is still polluting and contaminating the environment. And so this land needs to be healed. We need to reclaim our territory, reclaim our land from the impacts of this kind of degrading activities. And speaking about land grabbing and healing our land, I mean, these two go together. When our land is grabbed, it's like somebody is imprisoning our land, privatizing our land, and taking, disconnecting us from our land. And land to us is not just property. It's not something you own and have a certificate you can wave. This is my, my land. Land is much more than that. Land is life. Land is our culture. Land is the basis of so many other things that makes life meaningful. And so healing our land, challenging extractivism, and land fighting against land grabbing is so fundamental to ensuring that we have the liberty to enjoy the best that nature and God have given to us. Um, I'm speaking here with you, I'm here in your beautiful country, but some of the corporations from Canada who are operating in Africa are engaging in the environmental pollution, infringement of human rights, and massive land grabbing. And two of the companies, I would just like to mention, the First Quantum, as well as Barrick Gold Corporation. They are both not just contaminating, but also grabbing land extensively. And there are other corporations work in Africa, up to uh, 9,500 square kilometers have been grabbed by Canadian corporations. And that's just what we know. There could be much more than that. And some of the, 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 the worst hit countries are Congo Democratic Republic, uh, which is one of the places where you have the worst forms of environmental degradation due to extractivism, and not just degradation, but also political conflict and violence and war for years since independence of that country, but even the colonial times and pre-colonial times. All this has been because of extractivist activities that you can trace back in history. And so the particular project that we are working on today about land, 
uh, healing our land, challenges to activism and land grabbing. In two, we, we are focusing on two main communities. Two, two communities, one, both of them in the Niger Delta, separated by distance, but having the same issues that is confronting them, which is the privatization of their land by pollution. And this is one concept that needs to be stressed. When your land is contaminated, and you cannot use it for what you ought to use it for when your water is contaminated and it's continuously being polluted by corporations. It simply means that the corporations have privatized and appropriated that land. They've grabbed the land from you because it's of no, you can't use it anymore. You've privatized your river, you can't use it anymore. It just becomes a dump, a dump site for corporations. And healing our land re includes recovering, recovering our territories from these forces of degradation. And so both communities have got their lands contaminated by water, by, I mean, by oil spills. And oil spills in Nigeria, is, there are things that, you know, corporations just do without any sense of accountability or responsibility. One of the communities is located in Ogoni land. And Ogoni land uh, is a territory that gave us the very powerful pioneer environmentalist in Nigeria, environmental, environmental justice pioneer in Nigeria, Ken Sarawiwa, who was executed by the Nigerian state in 1995. Now, he and Ogoni people fought for a cleanup of their territory for economic, uh, for hold to political and economic marginalization. They fought for their rights. They fought for their liberty. They fought for their dignity. But he and other Ogoni leaders were executed and many were sent into exile. Now, as we speak, one of the communities we are working with is still suffering oil spills and oil pollution, and they're still being neglected. But nevertheless, by 2011, the United Nations Environment Program issued a report that really outlined how much the pollution was in Ogoni land, including the community that we're working with. You can see the hand of a friend of mine after he had dipped his hands into the stream. It, close to this area, we have on record from United Nations Environment Program that the water bodies and the groundwater in that area is contaminated with benzene, which is a known carcinogen at a level that is 900, 900 times above world health standards. We have also the pollution from hydrocarbons have gone as deep as five meters. That was by 2011. By a couple of years back, when the, uh, when remediation commenced in the area, we found that the pollution had gone as deep as 10 meters in some places in that territory. So every time there's an oil spill, it's almost like a declaration of war against the land, against the biodiversity, and against the people. And this is why it's so, so important that we should work with the communities to bring healing to the land, to challenge extractivist activities, and to end the impunity from corporations. And that's why we are also very glad that in Canada, uh, that you are engaged in campaign for, to have mandatory human rights and environmental due diligence so that, con so that these corporations, wherever they operate, would know that they have to account for every form of impunity. And so that was a report I just mentioned about the Ogoni territory and the UNEP report because that all covers this community that I work with. But there's another report that just came out in August last year from somewhere else in the Niger Delta that showed that everyone in that particular state is contaminated. They have a, a capita pollution of 1.5 barrels of crude oil. Every single citizen of that state has that level of contamination. All the water bodies are contaminated with levels, with heavy metals, uh, not just from oil spills, but from also from toxic waste associated with that industry. So needless to say that almost everything is on life support. But this project we're working together is help us and help the communities to really diagnose the challenges that they're facing. And we, we're just concluding, concluding a mapping of the areas and this will provide us with tools, very clear tools for resistance, tools that we could use for many, many purposes, including litigation, and tools that we could use by that could be used by the communities to begin processes of reclaiming their territory and also helping uh, nature to regenerate herself by ensuring that we don't have further disruptions 
of nature's natural cycles. Uh, so a lot of work is being done and by sharing, uh, share being a part of this net, being a part of development and peace, hearing from other partners, it's really helping us to, to get more, more, um, to get more ideas, to get more uh, instruments on which to further the campaigns. And we are so, 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 uh, we believe that with the kind of activities we've carried on so far with what is coming, really sitting down with the communities, reflecting on solidarity, on cooperation, getting communities to rebuild love that have been fractured by impunity of the oil corporations and anti-democratic forces, by just getting people to recover their joy and gladness in the struggle. Because any struggle that is not joyful is not likely going to go very far. So we need to find, we're finding ways of building back the harmony in our communities and getting our people really excited about the struggle, no matter how complex and no matter how difficult it may be. So our lands, our streams are, are being, we're fighting to recover them, to remove the vampires who have sucked not just our blood, but sought to contaminate everything about life. And we are so convinced that this partnership is very critical. And so the campaign that's being launched is not just a campaign for activists in Canada, it's a campaign that will provide tools for activists and communities around the world. And this is the way to build a real success in our advocacy. Solidarity, coming together and knowing that even though things may be difficult, uh, together we can break through the barriers and reclaim victory. And so I thank you so much for having me be part of this conversation. And I want to assure you that we appreciate so very much this partnership and for all the gains that we're making and all the learnings we're making, both locally and globally. Thank you so much. Merci beaucoup, Nimo. Merci de faire le lien. Entre... Thank you, Nimo. Thank you for being the link between the rights of the peasants and we have reasonable diligence or due diligence here in Canada. We have the right to a healthy, clean, secure environment. And if we want this to happen, we want the Canadian companies to have to do due diligence. So now I'm going to ask our next guest, and we'll wait for questions. If you've got questions, keep them in mind, and we'll be able to ask them at the end of the presentation of Aiden. So with any further ado, Aiden is going to talk to us about the uh, CNCA, which is the Canadian Network on Corporate Accountability. And he was a consultant for Mining Watch Canada, as well as a researcher with the McGill Research Collective investigating Canadian mining in Latin America. And so, Aidan, the microphone is yours to explain to us the work that we are doing in collaboration with due diligence. Thank you, Mayelin. And thank you everyone who is here in this room this afternoon. Truly, it's a great pleasure for me to be with you here today and to be able to talk to you about, about how we can protect our planet and protect the people. Let me just say a few words about the uh, CNCA. All right. Um, and then I'll give you more details about the need for um, a law for calling for due diligence here and protection of the environment. Next slide, please. Thank you. Okay, the CNCA is a network of 41 organizations throughout Canada, and together we remit we uh, we account for about 3 million Canadians. We represent them, and Development and Peace has been a member since the very beginning. And you are truly our leaders in this type of campaign and with Canadian companies. And so I just want to thank everybody here in this room who I know there is a great deal of interest. There are many of you who are very much involved in this type of um, struggle. And you've been doing that for the longest time. And just very quickly, um, our network wants to put an end to the abuse created by the carried on by our Canadian companies. Throughout the world, people are impacted by the um, impact 
of Canadian companies. And we are trying to get the government to put an end to this. And we think that and for I mean, I know we talked about this in the previous two with the two speakers, but I want to talk a little bit more for the actions here in Canada. For example, Canada sits on many multinationals with uh, other mining and um, groups throughout the world. And we know very well um, in the two previous presentations that these companies create serious abuse, deadly abuse to our environment, which has an impact on the people, therefore. And so the great impact on the peasant communities with, with contamination of the earth, contamination of the water, which has an impact on the health and the security of the people. And the picture here um, is a picture of community resistance in a mine, a Canadian mining company in Guatemala. And the people here are defending their rights. They're trying to t get them out of Maya Sikapapa, and they're a group of resistance. Unfortunately, the tremendous abuse that has been created by these Canadian companies. And so it is this type of um, abuse that we have to be able to go against. And it is a problem in Canadian businesses. And Just to um, highlight, I'm sure these are different organizations, including Development and Peace. They have a network of different sectors, including unions, human rights, or environmental justice, and other group, solidarity groups at the different levels from one part of the country to the other. It shows the support, support that we need to give through many people here to work on the question of the businesses. In a few words, I'd like to underline the elements of mandatory human rights and environmental due diligence, on due diligence legislation and need to be adopted in Canada. We'll hear, just to start, and I want to look at this quite quick. These laws require Canadian companies and companies importing goods into Canada to respect human rights and the environment. So the way in which we can work on terms of human rights and environment, we identifying and to doing everything as in their pos everything possible to help implement this. Another element that is really important is the fact that this, this needs to apply to all human rights throughout the entire supply chain. We've talked in this webinar on the importance of other rights, the right to a, to a, a good, healthy, ecological basis in, in, in the chain through the entire supply chain. And the third uh, important element, this, these laws help affected communities and workers to have access and remedy in Canadian courts. This is very difficult to do at this particular time. And that shows with how a law could be efficient. Do I like to highlight if Canada had a due diligence legislation, what that would look like? I'm not going to take too much time on this question or on this slide, or I think we've already heard the impact and the uh, importance of due diligence legislation. But uh, we have a super map and on our website that shows the le le impact of such a diligence, due diligence legislation. 
and to say the importance of a legislation that obliged the, the corporations to examine all the diff, all the all the things that they're, where they're involved and implement new methods to clean up where, where it is and where it has to be done. Your key elements are all written in, in, in this law with the CNCA. This is a law that was a model of law. And once more, there are eight elements that are essential in taking into account all the human rights that need to be respected. This one, to conclude, we are a movement that's in building. I know that in the room today, a lot of people, as I said at the beginning, I've been in solidarity for a long time now in terms of asking the Canadian government to change. So how this work can be in, 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 uh, carried out. And for example, many of you participated last year Throughout Canada, people said well, there was 43 signatures on a law on due diligence. And it's, now it's 50,000. We think that this petition is the official response to the government in terms of due diligence. So this is important, the impact that this pressure has, has in terms of our involvement. And the government has committed itself to look, to look at the question of the supply chain. And I also say this creates a certain importance to keep the government awake at this time, that because food is, is very important and we should be part of a due diligence law governing, governing big business. We don't have much information of the continent of the law from the government. And even with due diligence, which is a sign, there are signs that the approach by the government will not we can maybe not does not respond to the law that, that we need to have so it's, it's an important time to go to go into action and highlight what we really need and just a, a little the last point And this touches the other topics we've dealt with it today in this webinar. We're not alone to work at, at this way in Canada. There are social movements throughout the world that are asking the government to make the to, to make it the established law governing big business in terms of due diligence for human rights. Just a few examples. There's a European law that just was established this year on due diligence. And some papers in, in South Korea, Japan. So there's, uh, once more, there's a really uh, thrust in the world uh, to launch this campaign in asking governments to make for the government for the big businesses to ch check out their impact on the environment 
I'm going to stop here. Thank you. So thank you very much once more to for all your efforts and campaign campaign efforts. I was happy to share with you in this campaign. I think it's very important, and I want to thank you. Thank you very much once more for sharing. Thank you, Eden. I'm glad to see that we had gathered 50,000 signatures back for the People Planet First campaign. So now let's double these numbers. Last year for the Stand for the Land campaign, we reached more than 52,000 signatures. So let's try to uh, get as many signatures as possible on this campaign with everybody getting involved and helping. So now we will have a quick uh, Q&A session. So I invite you to uh, raise your hand and we will uh, let you ask your questions for any of our three guests. Oui, bonjour. Yes, Pierre Lachance. So I appreciated the witness of Aiden, Aiden's presentation. If somebody can contradict me, I'd be very happy personally, as was mentioned. We really have to deal what piece on by piece I believe that the, the importance of development and peace in, uh, involved here. I have no faith nor hope as long as four or five countries that are in, have the right to veto, because that eliminates all the good work, work that done by certain communities. It would be possible, I think. I, I don't believe in this to change anymore as long as people, some countries have a veto right. I'm a bit mixed up here. I'm happy that UNDRA is working because that's for the farmers and the need these accountability of enterprises, many mining companies mostly. So I'm not sure exactly how clear this thing is. Yeah, I made a comment regarding the um, veto rights um, that generally there that con the context of the veto is generally only used within the Security Council, and uh, so the Security Council and the and the permanent members there. That's actually a separate process um, than the human rights mechanisms that um, adopt the UNDROP and the UNDRIP and those types of things. Um, generally, um, that will be um, they just the states just won't adopt it, like Canada did with the UNDROP. Yes, and uh, if I should respond to the other question about the complicity of governments and working with corporations and how we can co build hope, uh, I think this is a very important question. And this is this may be one of the reasons why we have this campaign and looking forward to working to create hope. Uh, and I, I do think that there is we, we have every reason to be hopeful that change would come. And uh, one of the things, uh, one of the pathways for building hope and for staying, uh, staying very firm in the campaigns against impunity and demanding for accountability is just the, is the campaign to have the tools by which to hold these corporations and those who are working with them accountable. And then due, due diligence tool is one, legislation is one. And then globally, there's a campaign for recognition of ecocide as a, as a crime. Uh, I believe that if we have that all over the world, we could very easily challenge um, that, may, that people who stay behind behind corporate shields uh, to commit all kinds of violence and impunity against communities and lands. But this would be would be possible to bring them from behind those shields and hold them accountable for what they've done uh, while they sit, sat on the boardrooms of those corporations. So yes, there's a reason to hope and there's reason to keep on campaigning because if we give up and then <laughs> we would have lost all. And we can't afford to lose more than what we've lost. Thank you. Just the link between the needs of the peasants and, and due diligence here in Canada when I talk about the importance of due diligence and reasonable diligence being done, we're talking about the human rights. We're talking about the rights of the peasants. This is a mechanism or a law on due diligence that could be used yeah, 
to defend the rights of peasants and of and of peoples and that we could hold them to be accountable, these Canadian companies, to be uh, accountable for what they're doing in these other countries. Okay, thank you. I don't think we'll be able to take all of the questions, but I'm going to ask two more. And then after that, we're going to have to uh, close the webinar. Mr. Stocking, please, and yes, Simon. Thank you. Thanks very much. I'll be quick. Um, it was sad to see that Europe is already ahead of Canada in terms of due diligence legislation and law. And in talking to Canadians from parishes, it would be nice to sort of point out, hey, we've got to get moving. Now, my question is addressed to Aidan. What is happening in the United States? If anything, their corporations are even bigger and uh, more powerful abroad. Yeah, I can speak to that that briefly. And, and in short, the answer is that there is there are like there is a, a similar civil society movement pushing for this kind of legislation in the U.S. as well. Um, it's it's at a, it's not at the same stage. Like it, we're we're a bit further along in in Canada in terms of of having you know having model legislation and, and like like the campaign is 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 further here than it is in the U.S. But there is. There is a grassroots, like there is a, a grassroots and civil society movement that is that is making this push in the U.S. as well. Um, I like I, I'm happy to talk more in detail about they've got some particularities in the way that they're approaching that, given the kind of the U.S. context, um, and they're linking it to some existing U.S. legislation. And I, I could I can share some resources if, if helpful. Our, our sort of our our, our um, kind of allied uh, network in the U U.S. is called the International Corporate Accountability Roundtable, and they're working on a lot of of of, of this from the U.S. perspective. Um, so I'd encourage folks who are interested in in the U.S. in U.S. developments to check out the International Corporate Accountability Roundtable. Thank you. Merci, uh, pour la dernière question, je demanderai à Simon. Over the last question, Simon Fournier. Simon. Yes. Hello, everyone. I think that. I mean, I found all of this thing is good for us to call for a law on due diligence. It's a very good step forward but you know as long as there's going to be um oil companies and mining companies that are going to be working in the bowels of the earth you cannot do otherwise than pollute than destroy but it's not normal that the peasants would have to pay for this mess for this waste it seems to me, I'm sure we've certainly talked about this or thought about it, but could we not pay ahead of time for each ton of oil and of, I don't know, ores or whatever is produced to pay in order to compensate for all of the mess of all of the pollution that has come about because of these industries? Honestly, I think that we would have to go forward and make them pay something like a fine Anyone want to answer that question from the panelists? Uh, yes, a quick quick response to that. Um, I think the ultimate solution actually um, paying a fine uh, under the polluter pays principle or paying advance and paying fines in advance would work. And actually, most mining uh, agreed contracts and oil drilling contracts is always usually a clause for restoration of the environment uh, at the end of the of the life of that mine or oil well, but this is hardly ever done anywhere in the world. There are time bombs, time bombs in quotes, or abandoned oil wells across the world, hundreds if not thousands of them, and the corporation just walk away. So ultimately, this, we're going to have to know, uh, to agree to put an end to oil, keep the oil in the ground. This, to me, is a simple final solution. And, and we really have to find other ways of uh, other sources of energy. And this must be um, the, 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 the transition we need has to be post extractivist transition. If we keep on, if we transit from oil to another kind of mining for coltan, for lithium, we're going to just replicate the same thing to become oil pollution from oil pollution to green colonialism. And so we have to make up our minds as humans that look 
we are going to, we're getting to the brink and we can't get ourselves out of a hole by digging deeper. Mm. I just want to say that in Peru, they don't even tax for over profit. The mines do not pay. It's the only country in South America. They don't pay for over profit, no taxes. And so it's kind of impossible to, to talk about fines. But also the uh, Peru is very rich in lithium, just to follow Nemo, the very rich in lithium. So there is a big danger there. Yeah. Luke, could you share the screen again? I'm very sorry that we can't take more questions, but I know that there's all kinds of training sessions taking place across the country with uh, our animators. So if you want to register and you want to get to know a little bit more about all of this or go deeper into this question, feel free to contact them. If you want to know more about the campaign, please go to our internet site and um, there are many sections here. And Luke, do you want to click on the link, the website link? Just so we can take a quick, quick look at the site and there you'll find all of your information, if it works. <laughs> okay, learn more. So on our, page, on our campaign page, you will see our own video and you will see more information on Undrop and the different resources that Celeste was talking about earlier, as well as a call to action is to sign the action cards. We have the three partners that we had this Lent. So you have the videos, the case of Bolivia, Nigeria, and Indonesia. And we also want to invite you to organize a solidarity meal. So that's a good chance for you to invite your friends and to talk about what is the provenance of our food for all of the resources that can help you to follow the campaign. Oh, oh yeah, I'll talk here. Uh, we've got a wonderful program here called Badge for the Schools, DNP Schools program. And we have a new badge this autumn that's called Food for All. I think it's Food for All in French. Nourir le monde, nourir le monde en français. And so, we want to, you know, look at those little things that are stuck on our fruit to see where they're from, learning about all of these things. And then you've got the main resources that you'd be able to ask for, and you'd be able to order from Development and Peace and send them to you. We have tons of action cards. We've got posters, and we've got uh, the uh, let, Let's Act guide. We have an organizer's guide. Um, whoops. Mm -hmm. We have uh, questions and answers, and we've got a theme um, presentation here on Darius themes on the topic that we've chosen. So go back to the PowerPoint, please, Luke. As I was saying, ask for your material, order it. We still have some, and we'd really like to get it all out there. And uh, next slide. Nemo is visiting, so if you're in the region of Thunder Bay, Winnipeg, or Ottawa, you will have the opportunity to meet with him in person and um, you will get more details on our internet site about the various events that are going to be happening. And so our workshops, all of the animateurs are uh, information right now. And so you can ask for more information in your region to know more about the campaign and you'll be able to use it with other people who are committed. Next one. Ah, oh, here we are at the closing prayer. But just before concluding and before Luke leads us through the final prayer, I know that the campaign is on the topic of the right peasants' rights and for reasonable diligence. But I wanted to talk to you about, we wanted to talk to you about Andra. We wanted to talk to you about, about peasants' rights and how we have to respect these rights here in Canada if we want it to be respected in other countries too. So that is why we mentioned UNDROP and the peasants' rights, because we want you to know that it exists and that the countries that we are supporting so that UNDROP will be involved in that country. We have to do our share. We have to make sure that our companies will respect human rights, respect and be responsible for their intervention in other countries. And so I want to just bring this webinar to a close. 
um, will think of human rights, but we're also thinking of all of the people who are going through these conflictual situations throughout the world. And I just want to take a minute to invite you to a webinar on uh, Palestine that's going to be held next 19th of October. We'll have three guests talk to us, um, Anton Asfar, Father David Newhouse, and of course, our colleague Nagi Demian. So that's it for me. Thank you for being present. I'm going to hand the microphone over to Luke now for prayer. Thank you, Myelin, and thank you, Myelin, and for your, you are the coordinator for our campaign, and we want to offer you all of our thanks, and I'm sure you want to join me in thanking her for the good webinar that she prepared for us today. So thank you, Myelin. Oh, I forgot to thank our guests. Thank you, all of our guests who were with us today. We really appreciated your presence. So let us pray to um, to to end our time together, and and uh, because of the terrible things happening in the world, we want to focus our last prayer on a, on a prayer from peace. So this is an, an invocation for peace uh, that the. Uh, the Holy Father gave from the Vatican Gardens. So let's take a moment and put ourselves before God. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Seigneur, Dieu d'Abraham et des prophètes, Lord God of Abraham, God of the prophets, God of love, who you created us and you call us to live as brothers and sisters. Give us the strength daily to be instruments of peace. Enable us to see everyone who crosses our path and as brothers and as sisters. Make us sensitive to the plea of our citizens who entreat us to turn our weapons of war into implements of peace, our trepidation into confident trust and our quarreling into forgiveness. So that with patience and perseverance, we may opt for dialogue and reconciliation. In this way, may peace triumph at last, and may the words division, hatred, and war be banished from the heart of every man and woman. Lord, diffuse the violence of our tongues and our hands. Renew our hearts and minds, so that the word, which always brings us together, will be brother, sister, and our way of life will always be that of shalom, peace, salam. Amen. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Merci encore tout le monde. Thank you again, everybody. And bon campaign on tous. Uh, wonderful, good campaign to you all as we kick off. Go get lots of signatures and tell the world strong laws to defend the rights of peasants and our brothers and sisters throughout the world. There's Joan's got the postcard already. She's already got it signed. Bon chance tout le monde. Merci encore et bon après-midi. Bon weekend. Au revoir. Merci. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup.